Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Slowing Down with the Scriptures. My name is Danny, and this is my good friend Chris. And this is episode seven. That's right. We're talking about transactional Christianity. Yeah. What, what is that? What does that mean, Chris? Yeah, what does that mean? What is that? So it's something we've talked about some here at Hope, and, uh, but I thought we could kind of explore it a little bit more uh, today. We're, I read this stat a while back, and I did a little research on it to make sure that it wasn't just kind of one of those phony stats going around. This is actually a reputable source from Christianity Today that says that four out of ten Christians in the U.S. are in churches that preach some version of the prosperity gospel. And that prosperity gospel, if you haven't heard that term, it just means um, transactional Christianity. It, it, essentially, it's the idea that if we do or say the right things the right way, that God is then obligated to do certain things for us, and that that is somehow promised in the scriptures. And if you're not blessed and balling, then you must be doing something wrong. That's right. Yes, exactly. I guess so that's, that's the, the opposite of it. That's the uh, that's the other side of that two-edged sword, right? So what was Paul doing wrong? <laughs> yeah. What was he doing? He wrong? lost everything. I know. Went Including to prison. his head, right? His, yeah. He must have not got that part right. But there, I I grew up like you know I didn't you know not 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 entirely, but I remember as a kid like visiting some churches with my parents. And like going to churches where like it, it really felt like if you gave and you tithe and you gave above tithe, that God would bless you. And there's all these stories about God giving people like nice new cars and, you know, and I don't know. It just, it always, it didn't settle right with me. It just, it felt weird um, just because like, I always, I just would always think about what, what about all the, all the people in other countries and other places that were doing everything right. They were like serving God, loving mm. God, and then suffering Yeah. or not, not necessarily prospering right. financially. Yeah. Um, you know? Yeah. What, what exactly were they doing wrong? Right. Yeah. But at the same time, like you see things like where Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive, and you read mm -hmm. scriptures like Malachi. Mm -hmm. In Mal Malachi is the last prophetic book in the Old Testament, and it, yep. and he said there, there's a passage there. I'm going to just kind of paraphrase it, but it's like bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And pa we right. pastors quote this all the time when we're talking when we want to teach on tithing, right? Yeah. Bring the whole tithe and see that there will be not be more than enough. Like your your vats, your barns will be overflowing. Like like there's just kind of this picture that if you just give your tithe. That God's going to bless you abundantly and beyond yeah. um, what you would ever need or want, right? Yeah. So, and if, if someone's listening and hasn't doesn't know what that word tithe mean, what does that mean? Oh, that just so in the Old Testament, the word tithe it means tenth, right? And so, it's in the fraction. Old Testament, it was kind of the way that God took care of the temple and the priests. Right. Um, is that everybody gave was was required to give a tithe, a ten percent of their income to to God and that that would and that's that was kind of just the way that God worked it out to take care of the the priests and the temple the levites yep. the people that that took care of the the worship the church if you will yeah um that was an, in the old testament and and then in the new testament um there there really is this theme of generosity right i mean from right. Jesus talks about it a lot he says, give, and it'll be given unto you, pressed mm -hmm. down, shaken together, and running over. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, I think, has been quoted also with this kind of same kind of uh, idea that if you just give to God, then you'll get blessed in exchange monetarily. Mm. Yeah. So I thought we'd zero in on one particular verse. I'm going gets, all over the place. No, <laughs> this is good. This is, this is what we want to talk about. There's... There's this verse in Psalms, this is chapter 37, verse 4, which taken in isolation seems to reinforce this very transactional philosophy that we're talking about right here. And this is, um, you'll, you'll probably know it once I start reading it. It's, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, which um, taken in isolation kind of sounds like if we love him, then he will love us back by giving us the stuff that we want. Right, that'd be a great Instagram meme, right? With a sunset. <laughs> I'm sure it is one. It's got to be. 
Take delight in the Lord, mm -hmm. and He will give you the desires of your heart. Yes. So Sunsets and sushi. <laughs> That's right. So here's just a parenthetical thought. That means, you know, in parentheses, this, this idea that, uh, let's, let's look at the idea that, that Scripture uh, could be or should be consumed by the verse. So um, in the 13th century um, is, is when the Scriptures first began to be uh, kind of uh, sectioned out into with chapter divisions, right? And then if you fast forward a couple hundred years more, in 1551, a French printer named Robert Stephanus added the verse numbers to those chapter breaks. And so the positive is that uh, it makes it very easy to find right. individual verses, having these little numbers in here. So you're saying Jesus' Bible didn't have numbers. That's right. Yes. Well, it had the the book of numbers, but it didn't have. Yeah, that's right. It, it did. didn't have little numbers next to each word. Next to the text. That, that, so you could quote a, a passage. So you could say, "What does that verse say?" Right. Exactly. Right. So it. So the plus side is it makes it very easy for us to find yeah. one individual verse. The the negative is that it makes it very easy for us to find one individual verse, and therefore, um, it, it kind of institutes a a sort of uh, laziness, I think, in the sense that we we feel entitled to then pluck into isolation a one particular verse mm. and consume it by itself and have that inform our thinking. Now, that verse does have tremendous value, but we strip away a lot of the value by removing it from its context. It's so, like taking one line out of the TV series Lost and quoting it, yep. and you know, but you're, you're missing the whole story, right? Yeah. There's, a bigger, there's a bigger story going on. Yeah. That's a great example. I mean, I, I was a huge fan, still am, of the TV fan. show Lost. Went, went for six seasons, all kinds of wild mysteries. But if I you know, sat down with the writers of I that show... I still don't understand it. <laughs> no, no one does. That's the beauty of it. We'll, we'll talk offline. I got some okay. theories. I got Help a bunch of theories. Tell me out. If I sat down with the writers of that show and I said, hey, man, I love your show. I've never actually watched a whole episode, but I love your show. I, I just pluck 30 seconds out of... A particular episode, and I just watched that just by itself, and I love the story. They'd go, "You're missing it, man. You're missing like the the whole like the overarching narrative of the whole thing, and and you're disrespecting the source material too. We care. We put so much time and effort into this story, and you're just plucking these little parts hmm. um, out of it. So let's look at this verse in the story that it came from. This is Psalms 37, verse one through seven. Um, do you want to read this for us, Danny? Sure. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out wicked scheme, their wicked schemes. Yeah, so now looking at that verse in this context, this is a beautiful piece of poetry that is speaking about the unfortunate uh, uh, reality of the world and its brokenness. And how wicked people prosper sometimes. Yeah, people make bad decisions and the justice that we think they deserve, they don't always get. Uh, in other words, someone makes a bad choice and they get good things from it. Someone makes a good choice and bad things happen to them. So there's this injustice and in the, with the framework, the backdrop of that injustice, he's, what is he calling us to do? He's calling us to, to wait and yeah. be patient commit to meditate to, yeah commit and, and and in the middle of that that this uh, call towards patience and trust and wait he says this he says take delight in the lord um that word delight is uh, in the hebrew is has this um connotation of luxury in other words uh it's kind of like uh, uh take pleasure from laying back on this luxurious pillow like this purple couch like this 
beautiful velvet purple cashmere. The folks at home don't know the kind of luxury that we're sitting on right now. This is this is crushed velvet. When we go back to public services, maybe we'll let people sit on this thing. We'll, we'll do like a, will we? I don't know, maybe not. Talk, we'll talk about it. I, this is luxury. This is luxury, yeah. Donated from a closed Starbucks. Just, so, just, <laughs> just, just saying. We didn't pay a dime for it. We gave to the Lord and he blessed us. <laughs> With this purple couch. With the purple couch. That's right. So so the this verse is a call to, so take delight in the luxurious presence of God. In other mm-hmm. words, just lay back for a minute and and let God kind of whisper in your ear God thoughts. And and then it says, and here's the promise, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So does that mean, what is he going to take that moment to do? What are those God thoughts going to be? It, 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 uh, do we imagine that it's God wants to talk about blessing us with stuff, with physical things? Or, uh, taken in the context of this story, is it that he wants to change our hearts so that our heart desires actually reflect his heart's desires. So right now during this mm. lockdown thing, uh, I've been playing video games with my kids. Heck yeah. And Mario I, Kart? Mario Kart. Yep. Yes. We've been playing Us Le- too. Lego Star Wars on the Nintendo GameCube. I got to get that one, man. Yeah. We we just pulled the video game box that we my my wife would want me to say this. We used to play like a couple times a year. Now we like we pulled this thing out and it's staying out, you know. Um, and my kids are loving it, but the the negative consequence of that is that it's all they want to talk about, like all the time. Like yeah. I get home from work and you know Ben's like, "Hey, Dad, hey, uh, so tonight when we play, uh, you know, Lego Star Wars, I'm gonna beat this level." And you know, when I'm putting him to bed, I want, you know, I'm, I'm putting him down <laughs> down to bed. I want to have this moment with him, and you know, all you can t- think about is Star- all you can think about Lego is, Star Wars. Yeah, that's right, because they're kids. Yeah. They're, there's not that maturity yet, and in their world, they're the center of the universe. They haven't grown and matured to the point where they realize, well, their story is just one of many stories, and. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we begin to read the scriptures and we move away from reading these scriptures egocentrically, yeah. we begin to see not only is mm. ours just one of many stories, but this is actually God's story. And we right. just play a small role in that. I just finished a really good book, a novel, and I was thinking this morning about how silly it would be if I, if I read this story and I put myself into the story, if I imagined that I was the main character of that story. And that's kind of what people do with the scriptures. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, the difference there is that the author of this book, the author of that book that I just read, he doesn't know me. He doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know me from Adam. The author of this book that we're talking about, he knows me. Hmm. So while it's not my story, it does speak to me. Yeah. And as, as the author of this story, God, begins to put new desires in my heart, those desires are things like compassion for the poor, Kindness for the disenfranchised, hospitality for the refugee. These are things that I didn't start out with, right? right? Uh, you know, my children don't have these kinds of desires yet, but they, you know, as they spend time and take t- delight in the Lord's presence, they too will begin, I believe, will have their hearts transformed and, and have new hearts' desires. I get that, and I love that. Um, I, love, I love the way you explain that, but... I mean, isn't there something to say for honoring God with your finances, right? And like, I mean, I mean, for us, like that's been a value for us is to honor God and to be good stewards mm-hmm. and to give generously. Right. And I, I genuinely can tell you story after story of where God's provided for us. Like we've yeah. been generous and we've we've made that our goal, not just at home, but even at, at Hope, where it's like this thing got started on a wing and a prayer. You know, I was there. We had yeah. nothing, and yep. we were gonna we were just generous with our time and our our, our we were I mean everything, and um, somehow God continued to bless and provide yeah. for this and for our families. Yeah, you know. So I, I mean, I, I feel like there's a connection there. Mm-hmm. At this, you know, but at the same time, like, I know it's not about us either. Right. I think there's, uh, so, you know, the, I'd say modern Christianity has made an inversion. And, and what, what I mean by that is there's this idea, okay, so, um, so God's amazing, right? He does amazing things. I mean, mm-hmm. look at the place that we live. It's amazing here. And 
he, his grace, his general grace, his specific grace for us is amazing. I mean, I have more than what I need. Right. So when I look at that, when I take stock and go, wow, thank you, God, I have so much to be grateful for. And I have a little bit more than what I need for my day to day. Mm-hmm. And I look at this person that might have less. I mean, what other right response would there be than to give generously right. of that abundance? Well, now, an inversion yeah. of that thinking would be, okay, if I have things and I give them to someone else, God will give me more things, mm. right? It's a different motive. Yeah. It's just a different way of thinking about the same situation. Mm. It removes the transactional nature and restores the relationship. Well, and it really is when you're giving out of the right heart, it really is fun and freeing yeah. to give to God, as to the church, to organizations, to um, help people that yeah. are in need, um, or even just individuals. Like we, we're in a we're in a hangout together on Zoom last yeah. week, and yeah. one person in the group expressed a need because they're out of work, and it was like so cool to see people come together and just generously like hook this person up. They don't even yeah. know yet, but yeah. I get to be on the in. That's one of the cool things about being a pastor is I get to be on. the the inside scoop yeah. on that stuff where I see the need pop up and then I see the resource and people give generously. Yeah. And there's just, it, there's fun and freedom in that. Yeah. But not because of we're going to get something in return. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe what we get in return is that blessing and that joy mm-hmm. and the freedom to get, to like not be afraid <laughs> that we're not going to have enough. Cause when you give, there's something, there's something that unlocks your heart too. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting the way you phrase that. Um, it's all those are all communal terms. You're talking about, um, you know, uh, blessing other people in our community and what a blessing that is for us. And how you know, there's all this coming together and all this relationship, right? As opposed to the individualistic uh, kind of thinking about this, where you go, well, it's it's me, and it's, yeah. if I'm going to do this, so I get that, and it's I and me, and that's not the narrative of scripture it's you know there's no solo version of christianity right and we talked about that um i think jesus brings a little levity to this subject when in the sermon on the mount when he's this is in matthew 7 verse 9 through 12 where so he's looking out at a bunch of people in the middle of the day that are just hanging out not working they've just followed him into the countryside and they're just standing around and he this is what he says to them he says which of you if your son asks for bread will give him a stone or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake, right? So he's kind of making a joke. He's like, who, who would do that? And he says, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? And those Greek words that are used there uh, for evil and for good mean worthless mm. and high value. So he says, you know, if you people who are just worthless, you know, he's making a joke. He's not qualifying them as worthless. He's just saying, you know, you're all just standing around doing nothing, but even you would give things of higher value to your children. How much more would the Heavenly Father give things of value? Mm. So what do we believe about God and the things that He values? You know, when we look at the story of Scripture, is it stuff that He values? Is it Mm. things? Is it money? Or is it people? Is it, is it a, a new way of loving and caring for people? Are those the things that he cares about? So if we're not being promised stuff in life, um, if we're not being promised prosperity, then what exactly are we being promised? Well, I thought you did a, a great message on this um, when you read from John chapter 16, 33, a few, a few weeks ago, a couple months ago. Um, uh, where you read this, Danny, you said, uh, this is in John sixteen thirty three. it says, I have told you these things so that in you, you may have, in me, you may have peace, but in this world, you will have trouble, right? But take heart, I've overcome the world. So what's the promise? The promise is actually trouble, that we'll experience mm-hmm. trouble, and we do, don't we? I mean, yeah. there, are, there is trouble in this world, but there's also peace. Wow, yeah. And that's a profound promise. When it ties in with the passage in Psalms too, in, in, in Psalm 37, where yep. you know he's talking about the wicked. Why are the wicked winning right now? Why, yeah. you know, why, are they, why are they allowed to do these things? And in the midst of that, God's kind of saying, hey, come to me, I got you. 
Yeah. You know, and I think that in the midst of, um, you know, the brokenness, the suffering, the need in the world, yeah. um, that God would invite us to enjoy the luxury, you know, of his, pre- his presence, yeah. which is his love, yep. his grace. Right. He offers us eternal life. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Yeah. He blesses us every day. Yeah. I mean, he already has blessed us, like with, like you said, just like where we live and yeah. all the things that we have, the air that we breathe. Um, and there, there's so many blessings that God has poured out on our lives generously. Yeah. And, and the response to that is, so, so as, as we enjoy him and, and uh, delight in that relationship with God, yeah. he begins to change our desires. He begins to change the prayers that we pray into prayers that he mm. wants to answer. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then we begin to look at people differently too, right? Right. I mean, we begin to look at someone that's in need and uh, all of the judgment is stripped away and we begin to think, mm. how can I be an instrument for good in that person's life? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Should we wrap up with a prayer? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can call you Father and know that you know what we need and you are a good Father. And uh, in the same way that we as dads want to give good gifts to our kids, you want to give good gifts to us. And um, at, at the same time, that isn't necessarily just material possessions. Lord, you have value in greater things that are of greater worth to us that you bless us with all the time. Help us to have eyes to see those things. Help us to enjoy and delight in you and take time to slow down and delight in you and allow you to transform our hearts and our minds and and just respond to your goodness. And help us in in light of the circumstances that we're in right now, Lord, to to be generous. Mm -hmm. Help us to to think about others and and experience the joy and the freedom and the fun of giving to you and to others. Knowing that in faith, Lord, that you have everything we need. Not because we're going to get something, but just because that's that's who you are and that's who you call us to be. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here, you guys. Enjoyed the conversation, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Thanks. Love you. Bye.